we would like to take this opportunity of Sheikh Rashid being with us to uh, try to benefit from his uh, experience. Uh, so we have a mic, uh, Munji, yes. So, <laughs> and, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not here. The real representative. <laughs> okay. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> please uh, stand up and uh, identify yourself, please. My name is Safi Hamid. I'm with the Center for Egyptian American Relations. And uh, I want to thank all the speakers, uh, but especially, of course, uh, our uh, uh, Sheikh Rashid. And uh, welcome back to Washington. It's always good to hear uh, your voice and your wisdom. Um, my question is actually, although it can be addressed to Tunis, but it is generic. It applies to many countries in the Arab world. Um, the splits in the society uh, is usually between two cultures or more. And uh, there is no doubt that it is obvious in places like Tunis and other uh, North African and Egypt in particular, um, where people look to uh, their heritage, Islamic and Arabic heritage, and others who look to more uh, European and Western. Um, how can you change quickly a, a, a mindset before one generation at least is is over. Uh, can you do that? I mean, it's um, because it says reconciliation. Reconciliation, uh, maybe coexistence is possible, but reconciliation while the cultural roots are different? That's my question. Could you please uh, translate okay. your question <laughs> into <laughs> Arabic? <laughs> Uh, uh, كثير يعني من المجتمعات العربية وأولها تونس فيها انفصال ما بين مجموعتين على الأقل أو أكثر uh, نقدر نقول مثلا الفرانكوفونز والأرب اللي يعني المرجعية بتاعتهم بتبقى مرجعية عربية إسلامية الآخرين مرجعية uh, أوروبية uh, هل ممكن إن احنا نقول تصالح أو uh, شيء في أيام قليلة أو في سنوات ولا هتأخذ مننا أجيال؟ فضل شيخ. All Tunisians are Muslim except very few people, tiny minority Jew. living peacefully in Tunisia without any problem. So we haven't, uh, in Tunisia, problem of identity. Our constitution have been drafted by more than 94%. So uh, we close down this uh, clash of identities in Tunisia and uh, we avoid in our party any sort of polarization we try to unify our people and to avoid the ideological conflicts. So uh, we, we have many, many, many problems, but not uh, ideological problems. So uh, Tunisians are uh, unified around their constitution. Our constitution mentioned that Tunisia is Arab Muslim country. So uh, our uh, 
state is not secular state, it's Muslim state. And since that Islam, in Islam there isn't any sort of church who can monopolize the interpretation of holy text, so the, the, the ishtihad, free interpretation is, is free, is open. So no one can pretend that he is the spokesman of God in earth. So who can interpret our, the Quran, for example, if we need an, an legislation is the parliament. The parliament can translate the Islamic values without any hegemony or, uh, or any sort of control by any institution. So our de differences our is um, with in uh, it's uh, the the from the or the essence of our problems is social politics pol political problems not ideological problem so we try to avoid any sort of polarization ideological polarization between islamist and secularist we insist since the uh, election 23 October 11, 2011 to work with so-called secularists to avoid this clash during this clash between Islamists and secularists last more than 50 years in Arabic world. So in Tunisia we insist that uh, the two trends can work together. And we continue that in Tunisia. Islamists and secularists working together without any, any sort of uh, exclusion. Our system is inclusive system, not exclu exclusive, uh, not exclu exclusion um, system. Thank you. I just want to add something very quickly because I think it has been underreported uh, in the United States. The important work uh, that was uh, taking place in 2012 and 2013 uh, around the Constitution to build consensus for the Constitution, I think is, was extremely important. It took two years uh, to write the Constitution and to build consensus between all the political parties, thousands and thousands of meetings and dialogues, some closed and some open, but a huge debate about every issue in the Constitution to reach consensus, because everybody understood that we don't want a Constitution for the majority of Tunisians. We need and we want a Constitution for all Tunisians. And that means that all Tunisians have to agree on the Constitution. It is very dangerous to write a Constitution for the majority and let the minority be excluded from the Constitution or feel that the Constitution does not represent them, even if that minority is only 20%, because that means that 20% will not identify themselves or will not uh, see the, consti the, the Constitution as their Constitution, will not defend the Constitution, and that will divide the country. So I think really what was very important in Tunisia is that we have one constitution and basically there is unanimity and there is consensus on the constitution so that everybody now is defending the constitution and the framework and the foundation for the state and for the, all the institutions of the, of the government and the relationship between the government and the citizens is uh, agreed upon in the constitution. This, is what, this was, I think, extremely important and this is what uh, found, uh, laid the foundation for the, for the successes uh, after that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ali? Thank you, Dr. Radwan. Uh, and uh, thank you, Sheikh Rashid.
It's really good to see you that in Washington nowadays. Ali, Ali, I think everybody knows you, but please identify yourself. Oh, my name is Ali Ramadan Abu Zakouk. <laughs> I'm an elected member of the House of Representatives in Libya from Benghazi, who never attended any session. I'm boycotting it. <laughs> I'm the uh, chairman of the uh, Libyan American Public Affairs Council in Washington, D.C. Sheikh Rashid, Washington without you is really very poor. So I'm happy that you are coming to Washington very, very frequently. I have a double question. Question number one is really, as a pioneer in Islam and democracy, and a pioneer that has affected many of our thoughts and the center is part of that work, uh, how do you see the Arab Spring? Some, some people say uh, it's almost like uh, a death certificate for the Arab Spring. We'd like you to uh, reflect on that. The second point is, is, is really personal because uh, as a friend and as a neighbor, uh, I'm from Libya and I know that Tunisians, uh, you know, as, as Libyans have a lot in, uh, of commonalities between them. But I have not seen yet a greater role in, from Tunisia to help the Libyans come to their senses and to reconcile their differences. It's uh, through their meeting in Sahirat uh, in Maghrib, their meeting in uh, Geneva, their meeting in Algeria. But I think Tunisia has got a role to play. I wish that you could comment on it and promise us and promise me as a friend that you will carry this message to your uh, government and to your people. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is, uh, as I understand, related with uh, the future of Arab Spring. It's, it's good future, inshallah. It's a good future. I fully, I am fully convinced and believe that uh, through Tunisia flame of uh, revolution, the Arab world enter a new era, a new time, the era of democracy, of uh, liberty, and uh, like what happened in uh, 18th century with the uh, French Revolution, for example, and the American Revolution, <laughs> it takes more than 100 you know, to liberate Europe from uh, the dictators. But finally, all of them, some of kings accept to, uh, to uh, uh, give power, give up to uh, give the people the power and uh, still as uh, symbols. Some of them, they, uh, they have been expelled. So the Arab world enter a new era. There is a new moon in Arabic world. Arabs tests Tasted. Tasted. Tasted, yeah. the, the freedom. And discover themselves. Discover that rulers, dictators are very weak. And the people are very, very strong. Sometimes we feel that uh, uh, things go worse than before. For example, what happened in Egypt, the situation of, uh, in Egypt now is uh, worse than the situation before the revolution. But it's, it's only the appearances. But reality, there is a new blood, a new, a new spirit in, in Egypt, in Arab world. And uh, young people now cannot accept uh, the media which praise night and day the ruler, 
don't accept the election by 1999. 99. And uh, the last elections in Egypt prove that there is a new, new mood in Egypt and Egyptian people will not accept this uh, kind of, uh, of go governance. So it's a matter of time. As a matter of time that uh, one Arab country, one will uh, gain its democracy during five years, other 10, 20, uh, as much as uh, the situation is complicated, as much as the price of change will be high and the uh, time will be long but it's a matter of time. So in vain, some rulers try to keep things as it is before, as it was before, because the situation is changed. So what happened, the, 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 the essence of Arab, uh, Arab Spring is that is what the change is the heart in the mind of people, the hearts, the people. Like what happened in, uh, uh, in uh, Fajr al-Islam, in the, the beginning of Islam, when the idols in uh, Arabia Saudi, uh, the Arab see, so the ideas as only Hajar, only stone, Stones. only stone. So our now uh, the dictators are stone. They skimmed. <laughs> Stones. <laughs> they uh, like what happened in the. Uh, so the the people now discover themselves, their capacities. They taste the freedom. It's no longer, no chance to go back. The change has done in the, in the mind, in the hearts, and the rest is a matter of time. Thank you. Thank you. And on Libya, Sheikh Rashid? <laughs> Libya is... <laughs> Uh, Libyan people are very difficult. <laughs> you ask, you ask us to uh, to intervene in Libya. <laughs> we are against any intervention, <laughs> foreign intervention, and. Uh, who and intervene, make interference in Libya, UN, for example, convoy or other, has, has succeeded or not? So they, it's, it's true they move from, uh, from Istanbul to Geneva to uh, Morocco to Algeria, but uh, finally, with the results, why you urge Tunisian to intervene in this? <laughs> if, you, if there is a, a real Libyan will to compromise and to give concessions, no, no, no one can, can help Libyans. If you allow me... Uh, to, to add one word about uh, Tunisia intervening or helping Libyans, it's, it's not about, about hosting meetings because we can host meetings and it, that's not the most important, but Tunisia is really ready and was ready. R remember what, what we did right after the, the, the revolution in Libya, more than 1.5 million people came to Tunisia and found in Tunisia refuge and, uh, and they were hosted by Tunisians, not in camps, but in their own houses. 
And that's an expression of the friendship and the brotherhood that exists between the two, two peoples. Now we have hundreds of thousands of Libyans living with us in Tunisia, and that's another expression of, of the special relations we have. But Libyans are having discussions, unofficial discussions. All the unofficial discussions are taking place in, in Tunisia. And uh, Bernardino Rion, before going anywhere in the world or even to Tripoli or to Benghazi, he comes first to, to, to Tunisia to meet with the president, to meet with the prime minister, to, be, to meet with uh, uh, Sheikh Rashid Ghannoushi and so on and so forth. So we are playing a role, right? We are not in the picture. We are not hosting official meetings. But believe me, what was done by the Tunisian to help their brothers, the Libyans, is enormous, is, is, will be, I think, will be in the common memory of the two peoples and the general memory of the Tunisians and Libyans. Before I forget, I want to also briefly welcome the delegation that came with Sheikh Rashid from Tunisia. We have uh, Antisar Khariji, the daughter of Sheikh Rashid. Can you please stand up? <laughs> we, ha we, have, we, have, we have Muad Ghanoushi, the son of Sheikh Rashid. <laughs> and we have two members of parliament, Sayyida Unisi, she's a member of parliament. I think you are the youngest uh, member of parliament. <laughs> and we are very proud of the fact that Tunisia has 38% women uh, uh, members of parliament. 38%. And uh, we have Usama Zghayer, also a member of parliament. Also one of the youngest members of parliament and the spokesperson for another party. How old are you, Osama? 31. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Good evening. Uh, my question uh, will be, isn't it time now for us as people of the Maghreb to take that relationship between the United States and that region to another level. I'm saying this because we have uh, our uh, the State Department representative is here with us. I think United States role in that region should be much bigger than what we have today, economically, and also at the level of the uh, high education. This is the, because this is the two keys of instability in that region. I think it's time for us also to get out from that French umbrella or <laughs> European umbrella that we are suffering from for a long time. Uh, by the way, my name is Belkasme. I am uh, uh, the head of the uh, Moroccan American Forum. Thank you. Moroccan? American Sorry. Forum. American Forum. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. I'd be, I'll be very interested in, uh, in hearing uh, Sheikh Rashid's uh, response. I, I, don't, um, I don't like to see our relationship, the United States relationship with the countries of the region or more broadly as some sort of zero-sum game necessarily. I mean, we want to build uh, you know, a relationship with Tunisia across all areas. And I think, for example, when President Kaidasepsi was here in the spring, um, we talked a lot about education, we talked a lot about the economy, we talked a lot about security, and we continue to do that. Um, and, and that partnership is very important to us um, with Tunisia and with other countries. We, uh, I think it's fair to say we never have as, as much in the way of resources as we'd like to commit and so on, and that's always a challenge. But um, I, I mean, I don't see 
uh, I don't see it necessarily as a competition. Um, we, we all have an interest in, in Tunisia's success. We will all benefit from it. And, and we work very closely with Tunisia and, and with those who, who share that ambition for Tunisia to, to achieve that. And, and uh, I think it, it's a relationship that, that will only grow stronger. And we have some meetings coming up very soon to follow up on the president's visit in the spring. And uh, I'm optimistic about uh, the, directions that, the direction that things are going. Maybe to add to what uh, was said by uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary de Rocher is that the United States also is coordinating with the other countries um, interested by the uh, relations with Tunisia. And within the G7, there, is, there are many meetings that uh, includes the United States, France, Germany, and the, the other members of the group uh, to um, coordinate be between them the assistance and the cooperation that, that uh, they are building with Tunisia. And uh, the last meeting was held in New York and was very, very fruitful. And uh, Assistant Secretary Patterson was representing the United States. And uh, there is a coordination between the United States and other it's important uh, uh, partners of Tunisia. Uh, and this is for the benefit, of course, as. Uh, Mr. Derosha said of the United States uh, and uh, uh, its its uh, its partnership in it with, within its partnership with Tunisia. Uh, Mr. Latieri. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Masmoudi for organizing this gathering and for the work that he has been doing in Tunisia and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank and welcome again Sheikh Rashid Ghanoushi for being with us in Washington. Our ambassador, Guyad, mentioned that Sheikh Rashid is helping our president to carry out his uh, program. I would like to tell, as a Tunisian, I would like to thank you for doing that. Uh, incidentally, Sheikh Rashid, our ambassador, Guya, is doing a good job in Washington. <laughs> I have a question, probably it is an impossible question, but I'll try to run it by you. We know from many years that you are a man of religion, that you have written several books in Islam, especially when you were in exile in London, and you continue to do so. Hence, now you became a politician. My question to you, Sheikh Rashid, what do you prefer, <laughs> continuing your work in Islam and strengthening our religion or being a politician? Thank you. <laughs> it's a tough question indeed. <laughs> Can't you do both? <laughs> yes, he, rep he replied. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, we have uh, three more questions. Uh, Manal. Right. Salam alaikum. Thank you, Sheikh Rashid. Um, first, I want to congratulate um, all Tunisians here for the win of the Nobel Peace Prize. I think it was a win for all civil society. It shows the important role. And if I can zero in a little bit more specifically on the role of women, and if you can talk both about the role of women in Tunisia towards reconciliation specifically, the active role that they played, not only in terms of representation, which is another thing we're very proud of, um, but along the same lines, if we can talk from the Islamic framework, when we're seeing some of the worst crimes being done in the name of Islam towards women, 
what can be done to really counter that type of narrative where women are now the targets, again, using an Islamic framework. Thank you. Yeah, it's better to respond this question to uh, invite Saida <laughs> Lunisi to reply. Because uh, Um, so good evening, everyone. I guess this is part of politics. You need to be flexible. Um, I, I wasn't expected to uh, be on the stage, but it's a great occasion for me also to thank you all to, to be here and to be friends of Tunisia at a, a particularly uh, exciting time, so we need uh, um, support. Um, so yes, very good question. Um, this is um, actually one of the main challenges of new Tunisia. It's to prove that um, Arab women and Muslim women um, are not uh, only this uh, very traditional uh, picture that we do of them, uh, which are women staying at home, uh, just being mothers, um, wives, sisters, and that's all. Actually, uh, women uh, in the Arab world, women in the Islamic world, are those um, who can bring the change and uh, those who can push for, for the change. And, uh, women in Tunisia specifically have showed during the revolution, uh, have showed during also the dictatorship that actually they were those who can stand uh, sometimes in the front line um, and, and prove that they are as worthy as men when it comes to taking political decisions and taking um, to, to be participating uh, in the process of uh, taking a decision for the whole community. In Tunisia, we did something quite good that we are proud of which was to um, adopt two main things. Firstly, equality, total equality, between men and women in the constitution. And I'm proud to be part of a party who actually pushed for that and voted for that. And um, the, the second thing is actually that we adopted parity. And this is something even the US can learn from. Uh, <laughs> To, to, to adopt parity in the constitution. So it is actually not a matter of choice, but it's uh, uh, actually to push, to encourage political parties to put forward women. Uh, and so change can actually happen, and uh, this is what we're saying, a womanization of uh, uh, institution, political institutions. And these women are those also who actually uh, hold uh, the voice of women on the ground at the local level, at the national level, who are doing their best, whether it is in the economic field, in civil society, in the academic field, uh, as workers, and we are uh, uh, you know, encouraging and pushing even trade unions to, including the UGTT, to uh, include more women in their boards and, uh, and to give them responsibility. And um, I would just conclude by saying that, yes, uh, we have um, a kind of uh, a very good situation comparing to other countries, but the new generation uh, is uh, still endorsing this fight and this battle, which is uh, more than ever uh, at the top of our uh, uh, political agenda. Thank you. Thank you, uh, she, Saida. She, I think she proves that what I have done yesterday when I dedicate the prize to the Tunisian women. <laughs> Saida mentioned uh, parity. I don't know if you're all aware of what that means, but there is a, in the Constitution that all electoral lists in all elections have to alternate between men and women so that you, if you have a man, then you have to have a woman, then you have to have a man, then you have to have a woman. And when they are elected, lists are elected in the order so that there is uh, uh, at least a chance for a woman to be elected. And it has to be, in, on every list, there has to be alternation between men and women. And this is uh, what has allowed Tunisia to have 38% uh, women uh, in the parliament. Uh, also, I don't want to forget to mention and thank Manal and uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace, who will also be hosting uh, Sheikh Rashid tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock. 
So uh, if you are interested, uh, please join us, or if you have anybody else who is interested, it's uh, at USIP tomorrow at 10 o'clock, he will be giving uh, a lecture also on, uh, on the challenges uh, in, in Tunisia. Thank you, Manal. Uh, we have time for uh, two more questions. Uh, let me uh, go here, Abdul Mawjood, and then uh, Joe. Abdul Mawjood Dardiri, a, a member of the Egyptian parliament, and I am in exile now because 177 of my colleagues are in jail. Largest oh. number of members of parliament in the world uh, are in jail in Egypt. Uh, I have good news, though. This is not all about Egypt. The good news is about more than 90% of the Egyptian people boycotted the, the uh, parliamentary election under the military rule in Egypt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That makes me really happy. And as Egyptian, I am proud of the Tunisian experience. And I look for the day for Tunisia to lead democracy in the whole Arab world, if not in the whole Muslim world. Sheikh Rashid, you have a great impact on the hearts and minds of young people. And instead of them going to violence and extremism, you're bringing them to dialogue and democracy. Now, my question is this. There are two theories. One that says that dictatorship is the best to serve the interest of others because it brings stability and security. The other theory says democracy is better to bring stability and security. Uh, I, would, I know where you stand, but I would like to know why you stand where you stand and what do you suggest for Egypt to continue its journey for democracy against theocracy and against dict uh, militocracy? Thank you. As I said, the Arab Spring will continue everywhere in the Arab world. And Egypt is the center of the Arab world. And uh, I, fully, I fully believe that uh, uh, democracy will prevail on the whole of the region and Egypt will be the leader in this matter, inshallah. inshallah. And do you have some advice on how we get there? <laughs> Sheikh Rashid. <laughs> do you have some advice? No. <laughs> He asked you if you have some advice uh, on how Egypt can get there. Yes, they have to have enough patience and the Shab al Musri, Shab Sabur. Egyptian people is a very patient people, and uh, Egypt is a very important uh, country. So, Changing, democratizing this country needs uh, to pay the price. If you dare to change Egypt, you have to accept the game that you uh, change uh, a country which is very influential in the, in the region. So it needs more time and more, more uh, sacrifice. You, Thank you. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even, inshallah. then the, you will win, inshallah. Joe Montville uh, also. My advice is to, you have to advise the Egyptian young do not uh, do not be misled and to push them toward the violence. They have to uh, ab ab 
abstain, abstain of uh, do, not do not get engaged or uh, yeah. involved in involved. in violence because they, they, the dictator would like to do that to push them toward to react by violence violence is not the the solution it's the problem so uh, the mature person like you have to advise and to, uh, to advise young people do not go in this way in this street which is closed thank you thank you our last question from uh, Joe Montville, a very good and, and uh, close friend of CSID, a former fo uh, founding member and board member of CSID. Uh, thank you, uh, Radwan. That's a good in introduction to what I want to say, <laughs> which is that in this season of awards, um, I would like to suggest that you get an award for your contribution from the United States to the building of this <coughs> Tunisian democracy. I know that you worked heart and soul uh, in the negotiations with, uh, with the 100% of the Tunisians who agreed to the Constitution. You're a passionate Democrat, and you're a passionate Muslim, you're a passionate American, and a passionate Tunisian, and you ought to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. very much Joe. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you all for coming. Uh, your presence here uh, means a lot uh, to me, to CSID, to Sheikh Rashid, and to all Tunisians and to all Arabs who have been struggling for uh, freedom and democracy uh, for a very long time. Uh, I am like Sheikh Rashid, I am convinced that inshallah democracy is uh, coming to the whole region, and inshallah, uh, the struggle will continue. It will not be easy. But alhamdulillah, we now have Tunisia uh, that has shown that it can be done. But more importantly, it has shown how it can be done. Tunisia showed a, a roadmap, shows a, a path on how to build consensus uh, between various parties. Uh, the how to build an inclusive democracy because by definition, democracy has to be inclusive and it cannot exclude anybody. Differences of opinions, of course, they exist everywhere in every society, but democracy is how we can uh, learn to respect each other, to tolerate different ideas, different opinions, and to uh, treat everybody equally. Alhamdulillah, now we have Tunisia, inshallah soon, we will be celebrating Libya and Egypt and all other Arab countries, inshallah. So thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Now, now that you have been uh, appointed ambassadors of Tunisia, uh, please uh, try to help Tunisia in, in, uh, in the next few months because the economic uh, crisis is looming and Tunisia really does need a lot of help uh, to to solve the economic uh, crisis. As Sheikh Rashid mentioned, there are many reforms that are needed and will, inshallah, take place, but they take time. But in the meantime, Tunisia needs help to sustain the economy, especially after the last two attacks on uh, the tourism sector, which represents uh, a big sector in the economy. So please uh, contact your congressmen and your senators, urge them to uh, help Tunisia. By the way, I want to thank Paul Med and uh, Steve McInerney here, and I think a few of his colleagues. As you know, they, uh, l just last week, uh, uh, they sponsored a letter which was uh, signed by 114 uh, American experts and politicians, policy makers, uh, who wrote to Congress to urge them to support and to increase their support to Tunisia as a first step to reinstate the $50 million that was cut by uh, the Senate, which was very uh, shocking and very uh, surprising. 
But even that, as we said in, in the letter, is not enough. Tunisia needs much more support uh, to sustain the economy. So we, we are counting on you to please convey this message to uh, congressman, your congressman and your senator and to the administration. We need Tunisia to succeed. We cannot allow to a failure in Tunisia. It's not an option. Tunisia must succeed. Inshallah, all the other countries will succeed. But right now, Tunisia needs your help and Tunisia needs to show that democracy is not just freedom, but democracy also gives and delivers a better life, more, uh, more economic growth, more employment to people so that people see the benefits of democracy and can be, uh, can be a model and shows that democracy uh, can solve all their problems. It's not only about freedom. So again, thank you all very much. We look forward to seeing you uh, at uh, coming uh, events. And uh, thank you and have a good night.